All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope Monday Night Bible Q&A. And as you can see, I'm by myself this evening. Uh, uh, we just had uh, a new member join our team, uh, Brother Jason Hill, and uh but he wasn't going to be able to get on uh, all the time. It was going to be, you know, a periodical thing. Uh, whenever he could get on, he would uh, get on. So right now I'm looking for the broadcast, just trying to check the audio real quick. If you just bear with me for a minute, I'm going to try to see if I can get this audio, uh, see if it's good. And let me see. There it is. Uh, let me try to click on it. Okay, so we got a, a good audio there. I'm going to try to click in, see if I can get this thing going. Click into this so I can see it better. All right, there we go. All right, well, uh, Brother Justin, I guess, isn't able to get on. I, uh, none of the brothers contacted me this evening. Uh, to determine whether they were going to get on or not. So I was just going to, you know, I, I'm like the guy, I'm the, I'm like the go-to guy. So if nobody gets on, I'm just going to have to run it by myself. So uh, we're going to do our best. Uh, you guys pray for me that I can uh, uh, do uh, these questions uh, according to what I studied. And I would, uh, I would like to ask, Everybody that engages in this broadcast, whether you're just watching or you're trying to participate and ask a question, that uh, you would consider uh, the ultimate question, that if you died today, where would your soul spend eternity? Uh, people die every day, and death is the ultimate equalizer. Death is for sure. Every single one of us have a surety that we will die. And at death, uh, where will your soul spend eternity? Uh, it'll be in one of two places, heaven or hell. Um, certainly, I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I don't. I, I know God, uh, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Ghost doesn't want to see anybody go to hell. Uh, that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And if you would trust and believe on that finished gospel, that finished cross work of Jesus Christ, you could be saved from your sins, have eternal life and reconciliation to God. What a great gift that God gives us. According to Ephesians 2.8, Titus 3.5, uh, Ephesians 2.8 says, not, uh, uh, not by works of, or actually that's Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And Ephesians 2.8 and 9 says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, are you saved? Ask yourself the question. And if you are, uh, what are you doing? Uh, are you doing anything for the Lord today? Are you doing anything? For, have you been doing anything for the Lord? Uh, we ought to be serving Christ uh with all our hearts because we love him, not because we're trying to maintain salvation or earn our salvation. Um, certainly every single day is a gift from God, even after we're saved, that we would live for him. Uh, what a great thing if you're saved to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and be a testimony uh, to your family and to your friends and to strangers uh, that that might draw attention to the Savior, and who knows, by opening up your mouth and telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ, they can actually look at your testimony and say, well, uh, certainly they have something that I want. It would be a shame if you had a bad testimony and they said, whatever you got to offer, I don't want it because you're living no better than I'm living. Uh, yeah, that would be a bad testimony. We don't want that. Uh, want to live for Jesus Christ. That's the better way to live. All right. Um, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive into this uh, first question here from Barry Bernard. Now, if the other brothers would have gotten on, well, certainly this may have been the only question we would have answered this evening. But being that it's only me on the broadcast, 
Um, we may get to another question. We'll, we'll just see how this first question goes because it certainly packs a little punch with it because it's not just uh, a simple black and white answer. I mean, we're definitely going to have to cover a little bit of foundation. We're going to have to look at some things in the Bible. Uh, I don't want to rush through anything. I want to give a satisfactory answer, well, I, at, at least the best that I can give anyways. I'm not a Mr. Know-it-all, never claimed to be, but uh, we want to let the Bible be the final authority in all matters of faith, practice, life, doctrine, and the, the decisions we make and discerning things, uh, whether they're, you know, real shady things in our lives that we don't are not too sure about uh, versus things that are objectively true in the Bible that we can know for certain and have a guideline to go by objectively. So um, again, uh, we need to take all principle in the Bible and apply it to the things that we're not too sure about. And thus we can take the higher road. Uh, the scriptural road is always the better road to take. Okay. So uh, remember, and also I like to stress on rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, that's it's very important. Uh, I can give you my opinion. I can give you conjecture, uh, but it's not justified that you have to believe my opinions. But if we got something solid in the Bible, then certainly you need to ask yourself the question. If God says something so clear cut and it's a commandment, it's what his will is, then uh, we need to challenge ourselves and examine ourselves to see whether we're doing those things. OK, uh, hopefully you take that in a good spirit. Um, we're going to do our best uh, to get in the Bible. Again, I'm, I'm a student of the Word of God myself. Uh, every day I try to learn uh, new things and apply them to my life, and I get corrected myself. And so don't feel like you're the only one if you feel like you're getting corrected. Okay? Uh, I've gotten corrected on, on 70, maybe 80% of my doctrine when I first got to my local church here in the land. And uh, Sometimes it can be frustrating. I understand that uh, you may have thought that whatever you learned was foundational teaching and and then you found out that it wasn't really foundational teaching. And so uh, you got to just have patience uh, with yourself, have patience with the word of God. Uh, know that uh, the word of God is is uh, an infinite word and and. Uh, you could say it take a lifetime to fathom all the, the Bible's truth, but I would say that it, it wouldn't be a lifetime in this life of in this body of flesh. I believe that in eternity, we're still going to be learning uh, the wisdom of the word of God. Uh, what a great thing that we have an infinite book uh, of God's mind to present to us his desire in our lives. And what a great thing. So I'm going to go ahead. We're going to get started here with Barry Bernard's question. and. Let me flip to my notes here. And it is from Barry Bernard. Hi, Brother Ed and Justin and Mike. And now uh, Brother Jay as well. Hopefully, maybe one day we can all be on here at the same time. Uh, thanks again for answering our questions. Well, praise the Lord, uh, Brother Barry. Uh, appreciate your encouragement always when you get on and communicate to us, uh, whether uh, through email or uh, when you're on the broadcast and you leave comments, I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, my questions, why Jesus told Mary not to touch him, John 20, verse 17. Is there a law in the Old Testament preventing anyone not to go near the high priest going into the holies of holies? And where did Jesus get his blood to go to heaven to put it on the mercy seat since all his blood was drained out at the cross, referring to Hebrews 9, 11 to 28. Oh, very, 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 very good questions here. Um, they're not going to be easy answers. Um, we're definitely going to have to go to the verses and look at them uh, so we can be more objective as we give some of these answers. OK, so. Um, I want to cover the second half of the question first, and then we'll go to the first half of the question at the uh, more towards the end of all of my notes and everything. So a few comments first, uh, a few prerequisites before we dive into this thing. Um, in Leviticus 16, 17, it says, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation 
Hold on. Let me let me put this on. Let me put this back on because I got my microphone here. I don't want it to be too far away from me here. So in Leviticus 16, 17, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in, in, in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And then Hebrews 9, 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Now, again, we, we, we've got to look at Hebrews 9, 7. That is the priest in the Old Testament that we're talking about Leviticus 16. Uh, it is the high priest and the high priest Aaron. Uh, he is a sinner, just like every other man is a sinner. Moses was a sinner. Job was a sinner. I mean, Every person that's uh, named in the Hebrews roll call of faith in Hebrews 11 is a sinner. I mean, we need to understand that, okay? Uh, I, I don't know. There, there's sometimes you get this teaching like, well, God chose certain people because they weren't sinners. I mean, we can't, we can't go down that road, okay? Um, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is a true statement for every human being that ever existed, whether you're talking about uh, Joseph, if you're talking about Abraham, if you're talking about Adam, no matter who it is, they're a sinner, okay? The only person that was not a sinner that was fully God and fully man was the one who's fully God and fully man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was fully man, yes, but he wasn't a sinner because he's fully God. All right, well, a little bit of that, you know, a little reminder there. So Hebrews 9, 7 is saying that he offered blood for himself. Jesus never offered any blood for himself, did he? <laughs> He's not a sinner. He doesn't need to pay for any sins he committed with his, with his own blood, right? Because he's completely sinless. Now, if you want to know the references for Jesus being sinless, 1 Peter 2.22 uh, 1 John 3, 5, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He did no sin, he knew no sin, and in him is no sin, okay? Jesus Christ is completely sinless. He's completely righteous. He's completely holy, okay? Jesus came to this earth to die for our sins, okay? That's very important, very important to know because uh, some sometimes you get some preachers out there on the internet Man, they're trying to make Jesus uh, like a sinner or something, like he committed some sin, like he was dying on the cross, not only for our sins, but maybe some things that he did wrong. But Jesus never committed any sins. Um, he is com he, let, let's just look at the concept of innocence. If there was ever an innocent man ever to be on this earth that ever existed on this earth as a man, it would be the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one that's ever innocent. There's people in prisons that claim to be innocent, that they didn't commit the crime. But yet you can go other areas in their lives and you'll find that they come short of the glory of God in a, a numerous amount of areas of their, of their own lives. Um, you got to take yourself and every action you ever had, every action, every thought, and every deed, and you put that next to Jesus Christ and you find that none of us measure up. The best person, the best, uh, what you would believe is a righteous man. You could put that person next to Jesus and he still comes short. He's still a sinner, just like everybody else is a sinner. All right. That's, that's important that we understand that when we're talking about, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and uh, what was acceptable to God, his blood. Okay. We, we're going to talk about all this and we got to make sure that our foundation is right. That's so important. All right. So only the high priest could enter the most holy place. Now, I'm not going to use the terminology holy of holies, okay? Um, that is not in the Bible. Um, I will. We can talk about the most holy place. Um, that's in the Bible. I think uh, people end up doing this holy of holies because it's just a tradition that's been passed down from, from Baptists that they ended up calling it the holy of holies, all right? Now, I'm not... I'm not going to be so critical on that terminology, but nevertheless, I want to be as scriptural as I can be, okay? So let's talk about the most holy place, and uh, then we can gain our footing from there, okay? So only the high priest could enter the most holy place. There is a tradition that the high priest of Israel would enter 
and here, here's the terminology that I don't normally use, the Holy of Holies, which is which would be the most holy place, in a tabernacle or temple with a rope tied to his foot and or with bells around his waist. Now watch, watch this. Tradition says that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies or the most holy place, on Yom Kippur, during the last couple of centuries of the temple, a scarlet rope was tied to his foot. A priest in the holy place tended the other end of this rope, or, or a priest in the holy place tended the other end of this rope, which had a purpose. If the high priest's sins were not atoned for properly, okay, he would die in the presence of the glory of God, correct? That filled the most holy place or, you know, the holy of holies, what people want to call holy holies. So think about this. Just just stop real quick because we got a lot of conjecture going on here. OK, uh, we I, no verses, no nothing. I'm just reading you what tradition says in Israel. Now, think about this thought. If that is true, then Jesus Christ would never have to put a scarlet rope around his ankle. Correct. When he's tending to the most holy place. Hey, I, it's kind of weird talking about this, right? Because Jesus Christ is the most holy place. <laughs> I mean, we're, for the sake of this article that I'm reading to you is the only reason why I'm even entertaining the thought of Jesus, you know, having some rope tied around his ankle and tending to the most holy place, right? The, the holy of holies, right? But come on, what makes the holy of holies? What makes the most holy place is to get closer to God, right? Jesus Christ is God. He's the most holy place you could ever, you could ever be in or be in the presence of. Okay. So since nobody else could enter that part of the temple without also dying, the priests felt they needed a way to retrieve the body of the high priest if necessary. That was the purpose of the rope to pull the body out. The bells jingling would be the sign that the priest had fallen to the ground dead. So actually, not just the bells jingling, but you could hear the bells moving around as the priest is in there moving around, right? So then when you, when you didn't hear the bells going anymore, so it's kind of contrary to what's being said right there in the article. Uh, when, you hear the, when you don't hear the bells anymore, then you know, okay, well, we ain't heard the bells in a while. Uh, grab the rope, pull the dead body of the high priest out. <laughs> Okay, so so listen, if this tradition is true, it would be a powerful reminder of God's holiness and how we should praise Jesus for the direct access to God's throne he provides. However, the Bible does not record such a practice. In fact, the Bible has specific instructions regarding what the high priest can and cannot wear. Uh, you can find that Ezekiel or I'm sorry, Exodus 28 to our chapter 28 to chapters 35. So 20 uh, chapters 28 all the way to chapter 35. It seems highly unlikely that God would allow this practice. Now, again, this is an article. I don't agree with everything in this article, but I, I thought it had some, some, some decent stuff about the tradition that we could share on the broadcast. Okay. His sound shall be heard, but if the sound is heard, then Aaron would be dead and could be dragged out. The holy place in Exodus 28, 35. It was the most sacred room within the tabernacle or the temple. The high priest was allowed to enter this room only once a year on the Day of Atonement. When he entered, he had to wear the clothes that God specified. Uh, we said that Exodus 28 on the Day of Atonement, the clothes were very basic or plain, as explained in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. So listen to this. My speculation, I mean, I just read you some some conjecture, some opinion, some tradition, right? Uh, my speculation, Brother Ed's speculation, Jesus did not apply. Now, now here we go. We're going to, we did a little bit of that. Now we're doing a little bit of this and then we'll kind of tie everything together. My speculation, Jesus did not apply blood on a heavenly mercy seat. And, a reason, and, and, and I'm going to give you some reasons for this, okay? I'm going to say that as an opinion, not as an objective uh, doctrine, you know, Jesus didn't apply any blood. You need to believe that or you're not right with God. I'm not teaching that, okay? Um, you can have your own opinion. You're entitled to it. But I'm going to give you some, some deductive reasons, give you some reasoning behind why I'm saying this. Number one, to say objectively that Jesus applied blood to a heavenly mercy seat is to assume 
with no scripture that there is a heavenly mercy seat. Now, again, don't jump the gun. Don't get off the broadcast. Let me finish because we're going to hit Hebrews 9 verse by verse, and I'm going to show you what it actually teaches. Okay, so just bear with me here because that's why I said we may not be able to get to the next question. We've got a lot to cover here. Number one, we, we just I just read my, my point to you to say objectively that Jesus applied blood to a heavenly mercy seat is to assume with no scripture that there is a heavenly mercy seat. Point two. To say objectively that Jesus carried his blood into heaven would imply that he had a bucket or some form of container of blood to pour it on this heavenly mercy seat, which has no scriptural support. And point three, to say objectively that Jesus had no blood because he emptied all of his blood on the cross is to assume something that scripture does not cover. I mean, Sounds great. Jesus emptied himself on the cross, but he could have emptied himself of many different things besides his blood. His love, his compassion, his mercy, his grace for mankind, his heart for God. And, and the fact that God turned his back on him and the love that he had for God, the father, he emptied himself. I mean, there's so many ways Jesus could have emptied that verse, him, him emptying himself could be applied. So You've just got to be placing your own idea in there and then making it a, a dogmatic statement and which can turn unscriptural. You, you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to attack basic tradition um, if it's correct and it's scriptural. But if, if there's nothing in the Bible that states it, I mean, come on, guys. My opinion is just as good as yours. If none of us have scripture for it. <laughs> OK, so let's go ahead and do this. OK, let's jump into uh, Hebrews nine. So go to Hebrews 9 in your King James Bible, right? King James Bible, don't get in it. We want to read, you know, together what the Word of God actually says. Get yourself a King James Bible. All right. Hebrews 9. Now, I, I snipped a little article from the Fascinating Truths book. It was really good. It, it, it was added into my study. And I really liked it. Uh, Fascinating Truths written by Pastor Knox. And uh, it's, it's a section on what happened to Jesus the three days and three nights that he was completing his cross work in the gospel. Um, what happened in that time period from the time he died till the time he, he rose again in his glorification. So here's a, here's a little snippet. I thought this was really great, great point and a, a great application to what we're talking about right now. Hebrews 9. Now, now, let me go ahead and read this to you. This is the only point of speculation in our lesson, um, and it, that's the lesson in uh, the three days and three nights of the gospel uh, in the book. There is, a little, there is a little controversy about this, and I don't know of anyone I've ever met who sees it quite the way I do, and that's Brother James, Pastor Knox, talking there, but I'll read it to you anyway. Then verily, now, now let's, let's do this, Hebrews 9.1. Then, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. OK, uh, this refers to the tabernacle, correct? The passage goes on to discuss the various items found inside. Then we read beginning in verse six. Now go down to verse six. Read it with me. Now, then now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone. Once every year, excuse me, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all, see, does it call it the holy of holy, uh, the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. 
But Christ, what are we talking about now? Christ. We're not talking about some heavenly tabernacle. We're not talking about some heavenly mercy seat. We're not talking about, right? But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. So who's the greater and perfect, more perfect tabernacle? Jesus Christ, correct? In the, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So here's the comment. Verses 6 to 11, it looks to me that this is his body, Christ's body. It doesn't look to me that it is a new building he built. He didn't build any building. So neither by the blood of bulls and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 12. Did you read that? Verse 12. That's what I just read. Okay. Let me give you the order of events which followed the death of Jesus and had to do with the offering of his blood. First, I will give them as the vast majority of commentators lay them out. Then, as it seems to me, they actually took place. So you get ready. You should understand this. The, the common view we're going to give is what traditional Baptist and Bible believers would give as the order of events. Okay. Now, this is going to help us as we cover this whole blood and mercy seat thing. Okay. The common view is this. Number one, Jesus died. Number two, he went to paradise in the heart of the earth for three days and nights. Point three, he ascended to the Father to offer his blood. Point four, he returned to paradise to set the captives free. And he says, the only reason I'm reading this is uh, this necessary point into their view because the captive souls could not have gone with Jesus the first time since he had not offered his blood to the Father. And since they, the captive saints, could not get into heaven until the blood was offered. And then point five, Jesus took the captives to heaven. So there's five points concerning this common view. Now, let me give you, now, I, Brother Ed can go along with this view that Brother James says is his view, because I can see that, and, I, and I, when I'm reading it in the text, it actually says what, it act, what he's actually saying here. Now, point one, Jesus died. Point two, he rent the veil in the temple from top to bottom, entered the most holy place, and offered his blood on earth, Right? Right after he tore the veil in two, thus closing the old covenant and beginning the new. Point three, Jesus went to paradise in the heart of the earth for three days and nights. Point four, he ascended to heaven with the captives. There it is. See how it's pretty simplistic there. No heavenly mercy seat, no heavenly sanctuary, no heavenly this, no heavenly that. But it's all Jesus Christ. No more does any priest need to enter the, the most holy place. No more offerings need to be presented. No more sacrifices have to be made. The offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all made every other sacrifice obsolete. See that? So, so, so think, think about this. As you're going through Hebrews 9 and you read it, it's talking about the high priest, the sacrifices that were made under that old covenant. But then it, it reverts to Jesus Christ in contrast, pointing to Jesus being the better sacrifice, the better tabernacle, the better temple, the better altar, the better everything. <laughs> Jesus Christ. See that? It's his body. All right. So there it is. So, and, and again, you know, that's just. That section, now you may look at some things differently, and that's fine. I mean, we don't have to divide over these things as long as you got the gospel correct. I mean, nobody has to see it the way I see it. Nobody has to see it the way Brother James sees it. I mean, especially concerning all the speculation and things that we're talking about. I mean, certainly we, we covered a lot of detail there, and some of it is speculation. Some of it is pretty solid in Scripture. So the things that are not that solid, you're, you have the right to have your own opinion about it. And we don't have to divide over those things. All right. So let me, let me keep going. Um, you know, we're going to put everything together, right? So there is something about Jesus being glorified 
after his resurrection that is doctrinally significant. Now remember, the idea, the old traditional Baptist idea is that Jesus had to ascend to the ascend to heaven, put some blood on some mercy seat, and then his sacrifice is accepted, correct? Isn't that the teaching? The this makes it hard on the gospel because sin, the propitiation, remission of sins, think about it, uh, the atonement, everything was dealt with at the cross. Correct? Colossians 2. Come on, I mean, think about this. Everything that Jesus Christ did, even look, we go to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, right? Think about this. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures. Nowhere in the gospel does it ever mention Christ died for our sins and then after he rose again, he appeared before God and put some blood on some heavenly mercy seat and then God accepted his sacrifice and thus he died for our sins and so we can be saved by the, by the gospel because it's complete now because he put the blood on the mercy seat. No, the blood was taken care of. The blood and the sin, everything was taken care of at the cross. Christ died for our sins. He didn't take those sins to hell and drop them off in hell. It says Christ died for our sins. It's really simplistic. It's not that hard, guys. Everything was taken care of at the cross. That's why we sing the songs like at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Jesus paid it all. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. He didn't say, wait, it's not finished yet. I still got to put the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. He didn't say any of that. Everything that dealt with the redemption plan was dealt with at the cross. Come on. There's, a, there's also a doctrinal significance to the resurrection. Now, I want you to see this. Um, go to Romans chapter 4. Go to Romans chapter 4 in your King James Bible. And I want you to go to verse, because I want some context here. Let's go to, I want to go to Abraham here. Yeah, let's, let's start at verse 17, Romans 4, 17. I want you to see this. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Talking about Abraham, right? Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Oh, that's right. There's a huge sermon in that one right there. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. See, he, Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness according to that which was spoken. He didn't do anything in Genesis 15. All he did was believe God and it was counted in for righteousness. Later, he was proving his faith by his works when he's about to sacrifice Isaac. And that would be the James 2 argument there. Right? So James 2 is dealing with Genesis 22. And Romans 4 is dealing with Genesis 15. Right? He only heard the word and he believed God is counted in for righteousness. Genesis 22, now he's doing something with his faith. God is testing his faith, right? All right, well, look at this. Look at verse 19. And being not weak in faith, which, uh, you know, Abraham was weak in faith, but ain't it great that God doesn't look at our weak faith? He looks to see if we have faith. And see, ain't it great how God sees us versus how it actually is? <laughs> Man, when you believe God, you're not weak in faith anymore, right? Uh, praise the Lord for that, even though we can see many times when a Abraham in the Old Testament had really weak faith, even concerning his son, his only begotten son, Isaac, right? And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but, but he did. But see, God doesn't look at that. See, there's a standing and there's a state. See that standing in state right there. God says, wait, even though he was weak in faith concerning man, but according to me, he wasn't weak in faith. See that? He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. 
and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. See that? Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Now, watch. Watch this. But for us also. Uh, this is a very, very hard verse for hyper dispensationalists. Because here we're talking about Old Testament Abraham, who wasn't even a Jew. He, co he come from Ur of the Chaldees. He's a Gentile, and his father is Syrian. <laughs> and here God takes a Gentile, a Gentile, and takes him out of the Gentiles to make a people for his name. Right? Ain't that, ain't that neat? He's a Gentile. And so we can learn from the Old Testament concerning faith and the kind of faith Abraham had, and we can apply that kind of principle to us according to Romans 4, which tells us to do that. Look what it says. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, so that's Old Testament, right? That it was imputed to him, but for us also. Come on, that's a, that's a nightmare for a hyper-dispensationalist. Because, like, well, you can't go to the Old Testament. You can only go by the prison epistles. <laughs> right. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that, watch, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses. Now, watch, watch the doctrine here. And was raised again for our justification. So what is, what is one of the... What, if, what is one of the principles in the doctrine of the resurrection that we are learning right here in Romans 4.25? We are learning the doctrine of justification that came according to Jesus' resurrection. How are we justified? We're not justified by the death of Jesus. We're justified by his resurrection. So the resurrection is important doctrinally in the gospel so we could be justified. Pretty important, isn't it? Amen. So that's so important in the gospel. He was raised again for our justification. So we see some importance here. Listen, 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 we're talking about the blood of Christ, right? Does it have to be applied to some heavenly mercy seat before God can accept the sacrifice of Christ? The answer is no. No. We just said it. All we had to do was resurrect, and we're justified. The, it's complete. Sin was taken care of at the cross, okay? Completely at the cross. Our justification is taken care of at the resurrection. See? See how we, we, we just proved that scripturally. There's no, there's no hearsay. There's no speculation. There's no conjecture here. It's, it's written right. It's written right there. We just read it. So I, I want to stand on what's solid in the Bible. I want to stand on what I know to be true concerning the scriptures that are so clearly presented. And if there's something shady, that a, a verse in the Bible that's pretty shady, and I'm trying to apply that to the gospel, I'm trying to apply that to the death, burial, resurrection, and the acceptance of that resurrection, I want to make sure that that's going to be objective, in which we just said it's not. It's some shady stuff. So I don't want to apply something that I'm unsure about. I don't want to apply something that I'm not, I don't know for certain about, and in which I have so much clear passages of what Jesus did on the cross and how he applied everything and how the, what the work of God was through Christ that I shouldn't have any doubt as to how sin was taken care of. I shouldn't have any, any doubt as to the atonement that was made for me and for the whole world. So let's look at a few more things here. Um, we, did, we did that. So uh, we did the Romans... Uh, thing there. Now, I want, I want you to see this. Go to John 739. Go to John 739 in your King James Bible. So, listen up real quick. Sometimes we just get taught some tradition or we get taught something that sounds good and then we tend to kind of regurgitate that to everybody else and we think it's Bible and we don't have a a 
some biblical support, but we just believe it on face value because we respect our pastor or we, we respect the church that that was presented at. And we don't question it. We just kind of assume it to be true. I would say, don't beat yourself up over that right here, brother Ed. I did that all the time as a young Christian. Don't beat yourself up. Have grace with yourself. Uh, have grace and patience in learning the scriptures. We all got to start somewhere. We all got to little by little conform. I'll tell you this. There's people that I've been around that have learned the scriptures for years and thought they knew what they believed about the gospel. And then to this very day are, are learning new stuff that they have to change their minds about. Remember, it's it's if you can be persuaded by the scriptures, it doesn't matter how long you believe the doctrine. If the doctrine is wrong concerning the scriptures and you learned it, it would be good for you to humble yourself in that knowledge that you had for so many years to humble yourself and say, you know what? I, I, I didn't know that or I didn't see that before. Um, let me humble myself to the mighty word of God. That's God's infinite wisdom over my wisdom. And that would be a good stand to have because believe me, I'm trying my best every day that not to be so die hard on certain things. But if the Bible comes with something that contradicts what I think, I've got to go with the word of God. I have to. It is the correction we need. It's rightly divided scripture. OK, so present party included. Uh, we all learn. I'm telling you, I didn't know half this stuff that I'm talking to you right now. Um, it took a while for me to learn it myself. And I had to change a lot of my beliefs to be able to kind of uh, conform to the scriptures in this way. OK, so uh, just mind you that I can uh, uh, sympathize with you. I can empathize with you because I've been there myself. OK, so here we go. We did. Uh, John 7, 39, let's read it. But this, uh, let, let's go back a verse here. John 7, let, let's do 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But there's a parenthetical statement in verse 39, the next verse. What does it say? It says, but this spake he of the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, that's the Holy Ghost, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Because, watch, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So you want to know the purpose of why Jesus had to go to heaven? Remember, he had to go to up in the ascension he told mary not to touch him you remember that and that's the other remember we were talking about the other half of barry bernard's question um and did he need to go to heaven and mary couldn't touch him because he didn't apply any blood on any mercy seat yet well john 7 39 gives you the reason why jesus could not be touched he was not yet glorified and so because he's not yet glorified the holy ghost could not be given so there is a purpose of the ascension, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Jesus applying some blood on some heavenly mercy seat. It was because he needed to be glorified by God to appear before God, and thus the Holy Ghost could be sent as a result of his glorification. See that? A need for the Holy Ghost to be sent, but the Holy Ghost just couldn't be sent. Jesus had to be glorified concerning his finished cross work by God. See, notice I didn't include any blood on any mercy seat. God, he's standing before God, appearing before God. And I'm going to read you the verse um, in Hebrews 9 about how he appears before God. But th there it is. You want to know a reason? There's a reason why he had to ascend. He couldn't be touched by Mary because he needed to be glorified. And then that thus the Holy Ghost could be sent. Okay. So we did that one. So that's John 7, 39. And then now look at Hebrews 9, 24. That's the verse I want to give you. Hebrews 9, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Now, look at this one. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, 
now to appear before the mercy seat in the presence of God to pour his blood on the mercy seat. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. We'd like to think it would say that, but it doesn't say that. What does it say? It says, for Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. What are the figures of the true? It's Jesus Christ is the figure of the true. Jesus Christ is all the figures of the true. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. See, Jesus is the most holy place. Jesus is the mercy seat. Jesus is the tabernacle. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is standing before God the Father and saying, I, it's me, God. You can now send that Holy Ghost because now I can be glorified by you, God the Father. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. It's Jesus Christ. We're not looking for any heavenly temple, heavenly mercy seat. We're looking for Jesus. The Hebrews 9, read it. Read it verse by verse. Go all the way down to the very end. And it's all Jesus Christ. Jesus is better than the temple. Jesus is better than the sacrifices. Jesus is better than the mercy seat. Jesus is better than the high priest Aaron. Jesus is better than the, than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is, come on, anything. Jesus is better than the angels. The book of Hebrews is known as, I mean, it's, it's got a topical, you, you can have an overview of the whole book of Hebrews. It is known as the better book. Why? Because Jesus is better in anything that's of this world. That e even that was even of the, the religion of Judaism. That was even anything concerning the Old Testament, whether it's Moses or Abraham. Hopefully, hopefully you guys uh, get a hold of that, okay? So, into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with, with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, which he didn't. Jesus wasn't dying over and over again, right? He only died once. And he's accepted by God, right? But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So where did he put sin away? Come on, where did he put sin away in verse 26? By the sacrifice of himself. That's the cross. See that? So that's, that's, that's very, very, very important, okay? Very important. Um, everything is dealing with Jesus Christ. It's not dealing with anything else but Jesus Christ. When you keep your eyes on Jesus, you're always in the right place. When you take your eyes off of Jesus and onto physical inanimate objects, even if they are holy objects, your eyes are off of Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ and you can render Hebrews correctly. Okay, so the book of Hebrews. So double ascension. Let's talk about this double ascension. In John 20, verse 17. Um, Barry Bernard had covered that. Um, Jesus could not be touched, right? John chapter 20, verse 17. Let's read it. Jesus saith unto her, he said unto Mary, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. See, he wasn't ascended yet. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. See that? So he couldn't be touched, could not be touched until his ascension. Now go to John 20, verse 27. And let's go back of a verse here, verse 26. And let's read it. Same chapter. Read this. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then saith he, then saith he to Thomas, Watch, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. He did not tell Thomas he couldn't touch him. On the contrary, he told Thomas he, he had the green light to touch him. Thomas, and, and no, nowhere in the, in the context did, does it say Thomas ever touched him, but Jesus said, you can touch me. So what happened? Jesus had already been glorified. 
Now he comes back to earth and he tells Thomas, okay, here, you can touch me now. And then he's on the earth 40 days and then he ascends again a second time, right? In Acts 1, in the end of John, right? His ascension. So you see that? There's a double ascension going on there. And um, pretty curious, pretty curious stuff. And sometimes people can jumble up, okay, when did he appear before God in the sense of when he was talking about appearing before God? Was it in the first ascension or second ascension? Could be both. I don't know. So again, Acts 1.9. Deals with the second ascension. Um, we can read that. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received them out of their sight. Luke 24, 51. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. In Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So I believe Acts 1, 9, Luke 24, 51 and Mark 16, 19 was dealing with the second ascension. And the first ascension happened between John 20, 17 and John 20, verse 27. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. Um, don't want to be confusing, but certainly we are accounting for uh, what people would think is a contradiction when it's really not. So Jesus showed himself to God. He appeared before God to show, to show that redemption was complete for mankind in his ascension to his glorification, and could not be touched by sinful man. The first ascension was for God's glorification of Christ concerning salvation. Now, I'm saying that. That's, that's my opinion, okay? The second ascension was for to send the Holy Ghost so men could strive to, be, to live a glorified life for Christ. So we, we got some good teaching, some good principles there, but that would be John 16, 7, right? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. See that? So at his ascension and glorification, thus the Holy Ghost was sent, the promise of the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, Romans 12, 1 to 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be prove that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit working in each individual, being dealt the measure of faith. Not everybody has the same. But the Holy Ghost comes to abide within every single believer and gives every believer a proportion of spiritual gifts. And you can read further down and you can uh, learn those truths in Romans 12. But nevertheless, we can see the Holy Ghost given the first time concerning salvation and the second time concerning sanctification. So you have being or receiving the Holy Ghost. Point one, number two, being filled with the Holy Ghost. See the difference? One is for salvation, one is for sanctification. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, um, so, and, and it kind of ties, I was tying that into the double ascension. So you can see maybe uh, some, these are, these are my opinions, okay? Um, I'm not really diehard about this, but it certainly is a neat thought. OK, uh, the first ascension concerning salvation, the second ascension concerning sanctification. That was the, 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 the idea I was putting into that. OK, so hopefully uh, some of that makes sense. And again, if you have a different opinion about that, that's fine. I'm not you know, I'm not going to sit there and argue with you about it. I mean, there's no no need to argue. Um, but if you wanted more clarity on maybe some more objective things like we covered in Hebrews and some things concerning the double ascension, we just covered some pretty solid things. OK, um, so you just got to take the opinion for what it's worth and then take the solid stuff for what it's worth. And uh, but it's, to me, it's always better. To, to be persuaded by the scriptures than some man-made tradition. I'd rather be persuaded by the scriptures and be wrong about something than to be persuaded something 
of something that's not even in the scriptures. I mean, when I stand before God, I want to say, God, I tried to follow as close as I could to your scriptures. Uh, I wanted to believe you, God. I didn't want to believe man. I wanted to believe you. So I think that is a, uh, a very uh, good uh, spirit to have, a very good uh, stand to have in integrity concerning the scriptures. Okay, so uh, hopefully that's helpful. And again, I, I mentioned before that we may only be able to answer one question. I thought I was going to be able to get to two, but you can see that this question was not an easy question to answer. And so hopefully, even though we didn't cover Hebrews all the way through verse by verse, because for the sake of time, I wouldn't be able to answer the whole question if we covered each verse in Hebrews. Maybe one day we can cover you know, Hebrews 9 verse by verse and literally give you, you know, an exposit of it. But uh, for now, hopefully that's acceptable. Hopefully maybe a question was answered here or a few questions were answered. And, um, and again, you know, if maybe if I'm covering it this at, at a, at a wrong angle that you were wanting to cover it in, just let me know, email me at trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. Let me know, Hey, you know, brother, you covered it another way. I was hoping you would answer it this way. And then you could be more specific about it. But, uh, but praise the Lord, I appreciate uh, questions concerning the scriptures. I mean, I know sometimes people just have some man-made stuff, you know, some doctrines from men they want me to cover. And, and I understand that we have something coming up really soon. I think it's a geocentricity versus heliocentricity. I, I, mean, I mean, we could answer those questions, but it's like, I mean, were you reading your Bible yesterday and you came across heliocentricity in the scriptures. Um, obviously, um, you're not going to get that out of the Bible. So hopefully, you know, we're going to try to answer the question regardless. I mean, you know, just for the sake of, you know, maybe somebody didn't know that or you know, it wasn't cleared up. You know, maybe we didn't explain it the way we ought to about the kind of questions we want. Um, it is a Bible Q&A, guys. We want questions from the Bible, uh, because this can really turn into some kind of a charismatic, off the wall, emotional, you know, we're just taking rabbit trails all over the place. They ain't got nothing to do with scripture. We want to be in the scriptures as much as we can, because in the scriptures, there's power. In the scriptures, it, it, we have the ability. Now, the Holy Ghost has the ability to pierce the heart and the joints and marrow. And now we can discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what we want. With, with all this flat earth stuff and all of these weird things like heliocentricity, geocentricity, we'll we really be up on a rabbit trail here. But um, hopefully in the next broadcast, you know, maybe we can just give you what we have on that. Uh, I don't know how many of the guys are going to be on this next broadcast, but Lord willing, uh, be a lot of people on there and we can kind of give you our take on you know, heliocentricity versus geocentricity of uh, the center of the universe, so forth. And uh, we'll do our best, guys. And again, a lot of this is going to be conjecture. It's going to be opinion. Um, you can have a different opinion and we're not going to argue with you about it. You know, if you, uh, let's just stick with the scriptures, get the gospel right, and you're on safe ground. Just try your best to learn the Bible rightly divided. OK, so I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go ahead and end it there, guys. I, I do appreciate everybody getting on and supporting the broadcast. It's, it's really it really means a lot to me and the brothers that are going to be getting on with me as well. Um, guys, I started this thing many, many years ago and um, it's been a, it's been a while. I, I, I can't. It just seems like yesterday that I just started up the Q&A and and I, I can't, it's hard to believe that I've been on here for years now. And um, I was hoping, you know, in a few years that there'd be, you know, a lot more people. I mean, because that's the whole point. We want to reach as many people as we can. So um, just I don't want to say I'm disappointed, but I praise the Lord for everybody that gets on and, and partakes of this, even for the people that watch the, the re-upload to YouTube. But I, I do pray and I hope that you pray as well that more people could be reached with these truths of the Bible, because I, I believe that a lot of people uh, fall out of the faith because of certain questions like what, what was asked this evening or maybe even other questions um, that are going to be asked um, on our list of questions. So it'd be great to uh, have other folks get on, even unbelievers get on and just kind of listen in. And uh, so 
if you could share the broadcast as much as you can, whether it's the Facebook broadcast or the YouTube broadcast uh, that I re-upload, uh, try to share those with as many people as you can. Get the word out for more people. I, I don't pay any money to Facebook. I don't want to pay any money to Facebook. I know, I know you can get more advertising if you pay money to Facebook uh, or YouTube. I just don't want to pay them any money. I don't, I don't have a lot of, a whole lot of money to begin with. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be engaged in that kind of a thing. So I got to rely on you and myself to just share the broadcast. And I share my broadcast with people. I tell people that come to church or when I'm out on the street, I offer them, you know, if they would like to watch the broadcast, maybe it'll help you come, get, come to the knowledge of the truth so you can trust in Jesus Christ. Um, I, I try my best in the in the little amounts of areas that I can, but I guess I would have to rely on the people watching to also share because you have people that I probably could never reach and uh, maybe it could be a help to them. I hope you consider that and uh, you guys pray for this ministry, pray that we can keep this thing going. Even though I got more people getting on, I got four people now, me, me included, um, it doesn't mean that that it's it's a it's a in stone kind of a thing, you know. You got to pray for this thing. This thing can just fall apart. You know, Satan could just affect this whole thing and everything fall apart. So just pray for us. Pray that we can take a stand um, on our broadcast here, and that we can reach more and more people for Jesus Christ. That's, that'd be so important. Whether it's uh, saved people to live for Jesus or lost people to get saved. And concerning lost people right now, I'm going to close out with a gospel. Um, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. He loves you. That's why he died on the cross for your sins. He didn't die for nothing. Um, many people, uh, even some Christians that I've talked to, uh, just, when I talk about the cross of Jesus, they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, and they, I'm like, what do you mean? You say you're a Christian and you're just like, yeah, yeahing the gospel message? Really? As opposed to talking to a Christian that just stops right in his tracks and says, wait a minute. He, he wants to give respect for the gospel that saved his soul, that Jesus truly did die for his sins and rose again a third day. And so he has this reverence and respect for the gospel. And he's not like, yeah, 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 whatever. No, on the contrary, he's very respectful towards it. it would be a, a, a sign of a, of a Christian that really knows what he believes. Now, I understand you can't base, you know, you can't know, you know, as an outsider, an outsider of the heart, you can't know what somebody's heart has in it. I'm just a man. I can't see your heart. Man, man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. I understand that. But we as Christians, Bible-believing Christians that are trying to fulfill the Great Commission, we have to assume everybody lost until they declare themselves saved, and then we question them. We say, you know, you say you're saved. Well, how did you get saved? I can't, I don't want to take you at face value, just saying you're saved or I'm just born again. People pass me by all the time, say they're born again. And then when I ask them, what does it mean to be born again? They don't know. So you, you got to question them. Some people just say that it's like, I, I need a pass to get by these preachers here because they won't, you know, otherwise they won't leave me alone. Oh yeah, preacher, I'm born again. You got to watch out. You, you got to you stop them. You know, it's not. I know they're trying to make you feel like you're just judgmental, intolerant person. You know, just leave me alone already, man. Stop, stop talking about the condition of my soul. I don't want anybody. Come on. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, a lot of people have the wrong way of salvation. Uh, uh, Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. They have a way that seems right. And it may be really close to what we believe. It may be. Hey, Jesus died for my sins, rose again the third day. I believe that. But it's not that alone. You got to do some works too. See, really close, but so far away. See that? Well, we can't have any works added to the gospel because then Jesus didn't pay at all. It's Jesus plus you. <laughs> I didn't have any part in my salvation and you don't have any part in your salvation. The only part we have in salvation is, you ready? is believing by faith in what Christ has did on the cross for us in his resurrection. See that? See how easy, real easy concept. 
but people make it so hard. So if you're, if you're lost today, and lost just means you have not believed the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. That's what lost means. You're lost. When, when, when a Christian says you're wicked, it means you haven't believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a wicked thing. Everybody's wicked. Every single person's wicked. They think we're only calling people wicked because we're, sub, you know, we're kind of subjectively choosing, picking and choosing who's wicked. No, all human beings are wicked. All human beings are sinners. That's why we all need to believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again the third day, in which we'll pass from that wicked sinner to a saved member of the body of Christ. It doesn't automatically make us righteous, but it certainly enables us to learn how to be righteous every day as we learn in church, learn in fellowship, read our Bible, and correct ourselves by the word of God. What a great thing. What a great thing to do. Amen. All right. So I'm going to end it here. I thank everybody. Hopefully next week, uh, this, this next Monday, we'll have more people getting on the broadcast to answer uh, the upcoming questions. And so if you want to know what those questions are, you can look at the, the title on this Facebook broadcast. I have posted the questions in the details section so you can see the questions, even the ones for next week. So hopefully you guys take a look at that. Hopefully to draw some curiosity, maybe you'll get on and ask a friend or some family members to get on and, and join into the broadcast. Um, great supplement for your Bible studies. Uh, we do all the work for you and you can just listen in and then write down all the verses and and just to, to be a help to you, okay? So there it is. Um, I'm going to end it here. Thank you guys for joining me on KJV Bible Scope Monday Night Bible Q&A. And if you'd like to send a question this week, uh, send it to trustthelordjesus at gmail.com. Uh, send it, and we will do our best to get to your question within the next few weeks as we answer everybody in chronological order as the emails come in. So thank you guys again for your uh, support. And I hope that you guys have a great and wonderful evening.